Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for the Bible. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the revelation you have given us. And thank you for the story of redemption, the story of Christ that was preserved for us. Thank you, Lord, for making us to understand, making us to see how much Christ suffered for us, for our salvation, for our redemption, and for our getting to heaven at last. We pray, Lord, as we learn, we'll appreciate everything Christ has done, and then we'll give our lives in response to Christ fully, totally, completely, entirely in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you keep us awake and alert and vigilant as we look at your word and study together today. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're getting near the crucifixion in the record of the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. Already now, you know, as we are studying, if you have been with us, we have looked at the arrest of Christ. We have looked at the betrayal of Christ. Now, what's the next thing? As they arrested him, and as they took him, they took him to the high priest, and he was to be tried. And we want to look at the process of trial today. Before they handed him over, uh, to the officers that will crucify him. And tonight we're looking at, at Mark chapter 14. We're reading from verse 53 all through to verse 65. Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 53. Please open your Bible, God bless you. And they led Jesus away to the high priest with him were, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And then he goes on to say, And Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat for the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Are thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and says, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard him, or ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Now in verse 65, And some began to speak on him and to cover his face, and to buffet him, and to say unto him, prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. That's the passage we're looking at today. 
And you will see that they were unjust as they tried him. Actually, they had made up their minds that this is the judgment they will pass. They had not even tried him. Nobody had witnessed against him. And they had not laid, laid on him any charge at all. And yet they had conspired together. And in their conspiracy, they said he was already guilty of death. So all this trial was just like make-believe. It was a superficial thing. And they hurried everything up. And actually, as you look at the laws that God gave to the children of Israel, Number one, they should have real witnesses. And then they should have defendants. That is, if you accuse somebody that he has done this, the people that witness against him, that's just one side. And you will not judge a case just because of that. You will get the defendants. That is, the people who will witness on his side. They never sought for and they never looked for anyone that will witness on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, they were unjust. That's why we titled the message, the study tonight, uh, as the unjust trial of the just. Who are those unjust people? And uh, look at um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, and look at verse 23. And you will see that these uh, people, they weren't just. Everybody knew they weren't just. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. By wicked hands you have crucified and you have slain him by wicked hands, by just and by uh, people who were unrighteous, and they were not they were not following the word that they held onto. Look at Acts chapter seven, verse fifty-two. In Acts chapter seven, verse fifty-two, here Stephen was talking to them, and he was reminding them what they had done, and he says, "Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted?" And they have slain them, that is, they've slain those prophets, which showed before of the coming of the just one. Ye have slain, ye have killed, ye have unjustly dealt with the people you persecuted, the prophets you persecuted, and now you have even taken the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers. Well, there we're told that Jesus Christ is the just. And as you look at the word of God, it's very clear that Jesus did no sin. He did no evil. He was the perfect one. These people that were trying him were the imperfect. It's like the imperfect judging the perfect. It's like the sinful judging the righteous and the holy, the unjust judging the one that is perfectly just without any evil laid at his feet. Look at Matthew chapter 27 and then you will see the testimony concerning the Lord Jesus Christ is life, is sinless life, is pure life and you will see he was the just. It says when he was set down on the judgment seat. That is, Pilate, when Pilate was on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, Have nothing, have thou nothing to do with that just man, with that just man. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Have you noticed that, that the wife of Pilate, the Pilate who was sitting on the judgment seat and wanted to judge the Lord Jesus Christ, the wife said, that just man. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it tells us when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Again, you can find it here. You'll find here Pilate saying, is the just person. The wife said, is the just man. He said, is the just person. And I'm innocent from all this. I know by conspiracy you've done this. And you are just in your trial. And I am innocent from the blood of this just person. It tells us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, and in verse 14. 
Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, we're looking at verse 14. It says, But she denied the Holy One, that's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the holy one, the sinless one, the spotless one, and ye denied the Holy One and the just, capital J, and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Jesus Christ is the just. Look at Acts chapter 22, verse 14. In Acts chapter 22, reading from verse 14, and he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, that's about Jesus Christ, and see that just one, and should us hear the voice of his mouth. In fact, we are told in 1 Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're reading from verse 18. It says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. We are the unjust. We are all sinners. We've all been sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Before we came to Christ, before Christ justified us, we are the unjust. And it says now, it is the just, the Lord Jesus Christ, the just, the Savior, the Redeemer, the just for the unjust, suffering for the unjust, and that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He was put to death, but he rose again. He rose for our justification. He is the just that justifies the unjust. As we look at this study, which is the unjust trial of the just, we're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the contradictions of false witnesses against Christ. They even contradicted themselves. And the judges, if they were actually looking for the truth, they were searching for the truth, if they wanted to judge righteously, they would have known. As the witnesses, the false witnesses, they need to even agree together, they shouldn't have by any means crucified or condemned the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number one, the contradictions of false witnesses against Christ. Point number two, the confirmation and faithful witness of his coming. It's very interesting, not only that, it's very instructive that in the midst of the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ, look at this, all those people came in the night with torches and with lanterns and with swords and with staves and with everything and they violently took away Jesus Christ and then they brought him to the high priest and all the members of the Sanhedrin were seated together and he knew they were judging unrighteously. He knew that they had made up their minds they were going to condemn him to death. But he was so cool and calm and courageous in telling them He'll come back again, that the betrayal will not be the end, that the crucifixion will not be the end, that the death will not be the end, and that the humiliation, the shame, and the reproach, and the speeching on him, and everything they were doing will not be the end. He still confirmed faithfully the fact that he will come again. That makes us understand, you know, if a man can say something in the midst of trial, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of misunderstanding, if he can still affirm everything he said before and he still said, I will come again, you must really believe that he's coming again. Point number two is the confirmation and faithful witness of his coming. Point number three now, his condemnation without further witnesses for conviction. They convicted him. They said he's guilty. They said, all oh, you people, what do you think? And they all shouted and they chorused it together. He is guilty of death. And they condemned him without even looking for further witnesses, even though they had not found real witnesses truthful witnesses, faithful witnesses, and the witnesses that actually attested to the truth, even without further witnesses, they convicted and condemned him. The condemnation without further witnesses for conviction. We're looking at point number one now. Point number one, the contradictions of false witnesses against Christ. We're coming back to Mark chapter 14, and we're reading from verse 53. 
Mark chapter 14, we're reading from verse 53. It says, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests. They led him to the high priest. That's the greatest, uh, the ruler of them all, the ruler over the Sanhedrin. But then there were members of the Sanhedrin. Those members of the Sanhedrin, they were made of different parts, chief priests and elders and scribes. And then he tells us in verse 55, in verse 55, he says, And the chief priests and all the council, that is, all the uh, chief priests and the members of the Sanhedrin, that's what it's referred to as the council. And all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. They sought for witnesses that will say what they wanted them to say. They wanted to put him to death. They said, we must get rid of him. They had decided that in their conspiracy. They were just looking for witnesses that will say what they wanted them to say so that they can have an excuse, a reason in their own mind for the public illegitimate reason to give to the public that this is the reason we have condemned him to death and this is the reason we are crucifying him. This is the reason we are getting rid of him. And it says, and they found none. And they found none none. Now can, now, can I just remind you of the law and the commandments that God had given to the children of Israel? So they just said they were following the law. They said they were following the word of God. You see those Pharisees, they were meticulous about following this law and this law and this law. They, they said they were following the reaching law. They said they were following the interpretation of the law. And they said they were applying the law to everything they did. Those people, when they went out and they came back, they must wash their hands because they said that is the law. All the additions to the law, everything to their hundreds of laws, they put everything together and they said we are law abiding people. Okay now let us see the law that they were given. We're looking at Exodus chapter 20. I'm sure if you know your Bible you'll remember that Exodus chapter 20 tells us about the Ten Commandments but we're reading the part now that applies to what we do to our neighbor. Exodus chapter 20 and we're reading from verse 12. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, honor thy father, you know that, and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And let's look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, thou shalt not kill. That's the law. That was the law God had given to the children of Israel. And these people said they were custodians of the law. They were the people protecting the law. They were the people keeping the law. And then look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In verse 15, verse 15 says, Thou shalt not steal. Verse 16 says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Have you seen that? Thou shalt bear no false witness against thy neighbor. And then in verse 17, it says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and his uh, man's servant, and his uh, maid servant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Now come back to that verse 16. It says in that verse 16, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In fact, you know something? God also gave them the law that if anybody bore false witness against anyone, what that false witness wanted to be done to the person he was bearing false witness to, that's what you will do to him. That means if somebody is a false witness and he says, I saw him, I heard him, I was there, this is what he did. And he expected that the person he's witnessing against should be caged with uh, maybe 39 strokes. Then if they found he was a false witness, they will pick him up and beat him with 39 strokes. If the false witness wanted the person to die and he had accused that other person of murder, if they discovered that that fellow was a false witness, 
what should have been done to the person he was bearing false witness to. That's what they will do against him. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19. We're looking at it from verse 16. It says in verse 16, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong. In verse 17, it says, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, shall stand before the Lord and before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. Look at verse 18. It says, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. They will not be in a hurry like uh, the people who said they were trying Jesus and were finding witnesses. They did it in the night. Naturally, in their law, they should have done it during the day, daytime. You know, when they arrested Jesus, they came with lanterns and torches and all that because it was in the night. And it was in that same night they tried him and they did not make diligent inquisition, investigation, interrogation. And behold, if the witness be a false witness, look at that, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, what will happen? Look at verse 19. In verse 19, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shall thou put evil away from among you. That's what they should have done. If any false witness came and bore a witness that was not true, and they made diligent inquisition, investigation, interrogation, and they found that that's a false witness, what he wanted to have done to his uh, brother or to his uh, neighbor will be done unto him. If they wanted him to be crucified and they discovered that these were false witnesses, then they will crucify those people. But you see, there was lawlessness among them. The lawlessness of the false witness and the lawlessness of the injustice of the people. As you come back to Mark chapter 14, and you're looking at verse 56, you will see that there was just lawlessness. They acted as if there was no law. They forgot their law because they had made up their minds, this is what they will do. It says, for many bear false witness against him, and their witness agreed not together. Many bore false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. If they were to follow the word of God in autonomy, and they made diligent inquisition, and they interviewed the people very well, they wouldn't have gone on in the way they went on. And then look at Proverbs chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 16. In Proverbs chapter 6, reading from verse 16, it tells us the things that God hates. It says these six things that the Lord hates, Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. I want you to understand and even on the line, the things that the Lord does hate. He hates all these six things, even seven. And then on the line, abomination. And ye seven are an abomination unto him. I want to tell you something. You see, these chief priests, if anybody came to their synagogue or came to their sanctuary, and for example, was wearing a, a woman wearing slacks or a man dressing like a woman, they will shout, they will scream, abomination, abomination. And yet... These same people were committing greater abomination. What does that mean? Understand these six things that the Lord hates, yea, seven, are an abomination unto him. What are those things? Look at verse 17. In verse 17, a proud look, number one. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, number four, and hatch that deviseth wicked imaginations. And look at it now, feet that be sweet in running to mischief. Look at verse 19. It says, number six, a false witness that speaketh lies. The light 
against Christ. They misinterpreted, they misconstrued the words of Jesus Christ. They changed the words of Jesus Christ and they used those words to be a witness, false witness against him. And these are the things that God hates and it's abomination in the sight of God. A false witness that speaketh lies and he that so it discord among the brethren. And look at First Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 9. This is the exhibition of their lawlessness. And this is the open proclamation of their lawlessness. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. That is, the law is not made to condemn a righteous man. The law is not made, and the lawmakers are not there to condemn a righteous man. And the people who were saying that they were the protectors of the law, and they were custodians of the law, they are not there to condemn a righteous man. The people that were upholding the law, they are not there, they cancel the synagogue or the Sanhedrin, they were not there to condemn, to use the law and to bench the law to condemn a righteous man. That's exactly what he did, both for the lawless and disobedient. For the lawless and disobedient, you see, they became lawless. It uh, tells us then that these uh, people, instead of following the way of God, and instead of using the law, are right, they misused the law. They misinterpreted the law. They misapplied the law. The wickedness of their hearts actually conspired against the Lord Jesus Christ and they became lawless as they allowed all those false witnesses and they took the words of those false witnesses. Now the question is, will they go scot-free like that? The chief priest, the high priest, the elders, the council, the people that bench the law to condemn the loyal person, the righteous person, will they go scot free like that? Look at the lot of false witnesses for their iniquity. The lot of false witnesses for their iniquity. Proverbs chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 5. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 5, it tells us the outcome. It tells us the age, and it tells us the judgment that will come upon those who are lawless and those who bear false witness and those who bring up false witness to condemn the righteous, to condemn the child of God, to condemn the just one. It says a false witness shall not be unpunished. In the Old Testament, a false witness shall not be unpunished. In the time of Moses, a false witness shall not be unpunished. In the time of the kings and the prophets, a false witness shall not be unpunished. In the time of Christ, in the time of the Sanhedrin, in the time of the council, in the time of this unlawful, unrighteous, unjust trial, the false witness shall not be unpunished. They themselves they said so. They said, let his blood be upon us and upon their children. And it wasn't quite a century. It was about AD 70, just about 40 years later, that General Titus came uh, to Jerusalem and leveled the whole city and destroyed their temple. And we're told that hundreds of thousands of them were crucified on different crosses. You see that? Because of what they had done, it says, a false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, saying the same thing. And even though he's saying the same thing, it is for an emphasis. And verse 9 is still saying, a false witness shall not be unpunished. It says it two times, under the old covenant, a false witness shall not be unpunished. Under the new covenant, a false witness shall not be unpunished. Before the crucifixion of Christ, a false witness shall not be unpunished. After the crucifixion of Christ, a false witness shall not be unpunished. At this hour, 
at this time, at this period, a person that had that devil inside him and he wants another person to be killed. He wants another person to suffer. He wants another person to be ground uh, almost like, you know, with a mortar. He wants another person to suffer unjustly. He wants another person to be in prison unjustly. And because of that, he's bearing false witness. Here is the Lord of the false witnesses. A false witness shall not be unpunished at that time and even at this time and he that speaketh lies shall perish it tells us in proverbs chapter 25 reading from verse 18 proverbs chapter 25 verse 18 a man that beareth false witness beareth false witness that's his character beareth false witness he bore false witness in the past he didn't repent he didn't regret, he didn't feel any sorrow, and he came son habitually, and he bear it, he bear it, he bear it. He did it before he's doing it, and he continues to do it. A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a mole, and a sword, and a sharp arrow. You see, that means then the judgment of God will come upon such people. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 27. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 27, it says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, enter into heaven, enter into uh, the place of rest and the place of peace and the place of joy at the end of life it shall not enter heaven and there shall in no wise enter into it anything anyone that defiles anyone that destroys anyone that bears fault witness against another person to destroy that person neither whatsoever worketh abomination false witnessing is abomination bringing trouble on another person as somebody bears false witness that is abomination or maketh a lie a false witness is a liar a big liar a dangerous liar an injurious liar a murderous liar or maketh a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lord is telling us very clearly that we should not bear false witness. They bore false witness against the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though there were contradictions in their false witnesses, the high priest, because that's what they wanted to do, they still condemned the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the confirmation and faithful witness of his coming. Look at verse 61 of Mark chapter 14, verse 61. Uh, before I read this to you, I want you to remember that if anybody be in Christ, if anyone be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. If anyone be in Christ, you must know that Christ has led an example for us that we should follow in his steps. If anyone is in Christ, he should know, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but yet not I, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, I live by the love, I live by the conviction, I live by the confidence, I live by the courage of the Son of Man, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. Why have I quoted those verses to you? We need to understand, as we see Jesus Christ in his trial, as we see Jesus Christ before the unjust, as we see Jesus Christ before the condemning world, and we see his attitude, and we see his courage, and we see his confidence, and we see his faith, and we see his firmness in confirming what he had said when things were easy, when there was no persecution, when there was no false witnessing, he affirmed, he confirmed the same thing confidently and courageously. You know what that is telling us? 
whatever doctrine we believed in easy times, we still believe that same doctrine in difficult times. Whatever statement we made and whatever stand we took, when there was peace, when there was no problem, we still make that same statement. If we're faithful people, if we're loyal people, if we're dependable people, if we're truly followers of Christ, we still stand how we stood when there was no problem, the wind that blows, the difficulties that come, the injury that people cause, and the false witness against any of us should not make us to change the doctrine of the word of God and the conviction we had before. Look at this now in Mark chapter 14 verse 61, and he held his peace and he answered nothing. He held his peace and answered nothing. Let me ask you, can you hold your peace and answer nothing when people make a big lie and manufacture a big lie and put it on you? Can you hold your peace and say nothing when people bear false witness against you? And you said, well, you see, you didn't do that. I saw you now. I was there. This is what you said. I can tell you the date. I can tell you the time. This is what you said. My brother, my sister, can you hold your peace and answer nothing when there's a problem between husband and wife? And then, unfortunately, one of the people, they go to the in-law or they go to anybody and they delay allegations against you. Can you hold your peace and answer nothing when in the place of work uh, they just want to get rid of you? They see that you have been getting on with the boss and you are likely to be promoted. And now they said, uh -huh, he thinks he's going to be promoted. Well, get him down. Well, cut him down. And then they say bad things about you. Can you hold your peace and answer nothing? That's what Christ did. He knew what they were going to do. He was in charge. You'll be in charge of your life, in charge of your temper, in charge of your progress. He held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? Here is the question. Art thou the Christ? Here is a million dollar question. And, and said, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Look at verse 62. It says in verse 62, And Jesus said, I am. I am. I am. He said, There's no doubt about that. This is who I am. That is who I am. And ye shall see. The Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's his faithful witness about his coming in glory. He had said that before and he's still saying that at that time, at that time of false witness, at that time of injurious, murderous arrest and trial, he still said, I am. The Son of Man will be sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And look at Revelation chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 1, we're reading from verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness before his soon disciples, as they loved him before his friends, is the faithful witness before his enemies. The people that wanted to catch a word from him, he still will not chicken out. And then I'll not tell them the truth. I'll not tell them, the, tell them the real thing because if I told them, they'll make you know the crucifixion a reality. He said, "Of course I am. He is the faithful witness." before those injurious people and after those injurious people it still confirmed Jesus Christ is the faithful witness what's the witness look at verse 7 now in verse 7 it says behold he cometh with clouds behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also 
which pierced him and all the kindreds of the usher will because of him even so amen even so amen now we need to understand this that Christ is the faithful witness. Well, can I remind you, there have been former witnesses, former witnesses. The former witnesses of his coming with glory. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired. He's talking of the former prophets the prophets under the old covenant, the prophets of the Old Testament, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Who prophesied? They prophesied, they preached, they proclaimed of the grace that should come unto you. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, those prophets searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, was in them, was in them in the past, did signify when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow of the crucifixion of Christ, of the death of Christ, and of the resurrection of Christ, and of the glory that shall follow. Those were the former prophets, the former witnesses, the witness concerning the coming of the Son of Man, the Son of God, with his glory. Come to uh, Psalm 22, looking at verse 16. In Psalm 22, verse 16, it says, For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. They pierce my hands and my feet. That's Old Testament witnessing to the fact that Jesus will be crucified and his hands will be pierced and his feet will be pierced. But you know, that will not be the end. That's same Psalm 22 verse 28. Psalm 22 verse 28. And the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. He will rise again after piercing his hand and piercing his feet. Then he rises again. He will set up his kingdom. He will set up the kingdom that cannot be destroyed and the dominion that will not be moved. And he says that kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. I'm sure you know this, Isaiah chapter 9. Let's read that again. Let's refresh our memory and mind and let's refresh our spirit with Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. After that, after that crucifixion, Christ giving for us on the cross of Calvary. The crucifixion will not be the end. We cannot say that uh, too much. The crucifixion will not be the end. After that, it will come with glory. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In verse 7, it says in verse 7 of the increase of his kingdom, of the increase of his government, of the increase of his glory, of the increase of his power, of the increase of his authority and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. In Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13, Daniel chapter 7 from verse 13, and I saw here is the vision Daniel saw, and he bore witness to that. The former witnesses of his coming with glory. And now it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. One like the Son of Man. Uh, that uh, the Son of Man was not a stranger uh, to Daniel. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
when they were in the furnace of fire. The fourth one is like unto the Son of God. That, that's the person, that's the Lord Jesus Christ in his uh, pre-incarnation as he appeared. And Daniel said, I saw him in the night visions, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. He's coming again. The former witnesses testified of that. And then it says, And he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him, Christ, near before him, the ancient of days. And it says in verse 14, in verse 14, And there was given him dominion and glory. is coming with glory. The Son of God is coming again in glory. The Son of Man is coming again with glory. He's going to have dominion and glory and a kingdom. And that all people and all nations and all languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. Actually, far back at the time of Enoch, that's far back in Genesis. But now the prophecy is recorded for us in Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1, looking at verse 14. Here is a Jude telling us about the prophecy of Enoch far back in Genesis, at the time of Genesis. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Behold, the Lord cometh with thousands of his saints. In verse 15, it says when he comes to execute, he's going to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their godly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which of godly sinners have spoken against him. Christ, the faithful witness of his coming in glory. And then those prophets of the Old Testament, the former witnesses of his coming with glory. It doesn't stop there. After Christ died, after he rose again, and then the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples, the apostles, he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, fearless witnesses. The fearless witnesses of his coming from glory. Those apostles receiving the power and the courage and the boldness given, the energizing of the Holy Spirit upon their lives, they became fearless witnesses of the coming of Christ from glory. In Acts chapter 3, reading from verse 20. Acts chapter 3, verse 20. And ye shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. It says in verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution, restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. All those apostles and prophets and preachers in the New Testament, in the Acts of the Apostles, in the Epistles, they testified and they bore fearless witness of his coming from glory. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 1, First Thessalonians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 10. In First Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 10, it says, And to wait for his son from heaven, his son from glory, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 16. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, it tells us that Jesus Christ himself, that he will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. 
Here are fearless witnesses telling us about the coming of Christ. It will come from glory. It will come with glory. It will come in glory. In verse 17, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. And to you who are persecuted, rest with us. And to you who suffer, rest with us. To you who are going through, who are going through injustice, like Christ went through injustice. And to you that have false witnesses, testifying and witnessing against you, rest with us. That's not going to be the end. You've seen what happened to Christ. You have seen that even though he was betrayed, even though he was arrested, even though he was crucified, even though he was unjustly dealt with, even though false witnesses came against him and the, and the manufactured big lies against him and threw at him, you see the end is still coming in glory. That's why it says, unto you are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And then it says in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, In flaming fire he'll be in authority. He will come to judge. He will not be under uh, the oppression or the pressure or the suffering of any high priest, any chief priest, any council, any Sanhedrin. He will come in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 13, it tells us we're looking forward to now, it tells us of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says, we're not looking back, we're not looking down, we're not dejected, we're looking up, because Christ is going to come in glory. Christ is going to come with glory. Christ is going to come uh, through glory, and is going to come with mighty power and authority it says in Titus chapter 2 verse 13, it says looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking for that great appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in glory, coming with glory, coming from glory. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28, Hebrews chapter 9 reading from verse 28, is saying, so Christ once suffered, so Christ once suffered to bear the sins of many and to them that look for him. You're not looking for the crucified Christ. You know, there are people and they wear a chain and then they have a cross and they have Jesus Christ hanging on the cross there. They have not gone beyond crucifixion. They have not come out of crucifixion. They have not forgotten crucifixion. They're not looking up to Christ coming in glory. They're not looking forward to Christ coming with glory. They're not looking forward to Christ coming from glory. And they're still, you know, they're still there and uh, you know and you still say I'm here uh, false witnesses and uh, bad witnesses I'm going through this I'm going through that cheer up because things are different now come to the right side of the cross and understand Christ now gives us glory in fact he died for us that he might bring us to glory so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin, without the sin offering unto salvation. You see, that's the glory he has brought us to now. You'll come to that glory in Jesus' name. You'll not be hiding behind a curtain, hiding behind a closed door. And I say, brother, I've not seen you for a long time. Sister, what's happening? I've not seen you for a long time. Oh, pastor, you know, in our place, in our community, here is what is happening. 
false witnesses, help me look into this, help me look into that. In fact, now they make me miserable. Make you miserable. Why don't you come to the side of glory? Look at this, Second Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. That's what we're beholding now. We're not beholding those, uh, you know, those I praise, how powerful they are, how mighty they are. If they want to cause trouble for anybody, I'm telling you, uh, you cannot escape. We're not looking at that now. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, a change into the same image from glory to glory. And as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let that Spirit come upon your life and be immersed in the Holy Ghost and be energized, empowered by the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and that Spirit of the Lord will change you into that same image from glory to glory. And look at Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verses 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verses 9 and 10, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, for the suffering of death, for the suffering of death. He suffered at that time, but now we see him crowned with glory and honor. Crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. He has tasted the suffering for you. He has tasted all that false witness. He tasted that for you. He tasted all the indignities. He tasted that for you. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Look at this, look at this. In bringing many sons unto glory, he brought Paul, he brought Peter, he brought James, he brought all those apostles, all those disciples, Timothy, Titus, Silas, and you and me and us and believers today in bringing, bringing, it's taking us from the degradation, it's taking us from all the evil of the past, it's taking us from all the dejection, it's taking us from all the sorrow, it's taking us from all the regrets in bringing many sons unto glory. Thank God you'll be one of those sons and daughters in Jesus' name in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Let's come back now to Mark chapter 14, and we're reading from verse 65. Mark chapter 14, we're reading from verse 65. And let us see the indignities and all the things that they did against him. And we're looking at point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at his condemnation without further witnesses for conviction. We're looking at verse 65, and some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. Why did Jesus submit to all that? He submitted to that for your sake and for my sake. He submitted to that for our sake, so that all those things that you went through, you will not go through anymore because of your salvation. Uh, it, this is the condemnation without further witnesses uh, for the conviction that they already determined. Uh, look at uh, Mark chapter 14. We're reading from verse 63. After Jesus said, you shall see, the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest wrenched his clothes and says, What need we of any further witnesses? In verse, uh, in verse 64, and then it says, Ye have heard the blasphemy. The truth is what they said was blasphemy. Christ said, I'll be coming again with glory. He said, You have heard the blasphemy. Christ repeated what Daniel had said in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and the high priest 
who ought to be reading the Bible, who ought to study the Bible, who ought to know the Old Testament very well. He said the quotation and the application and the repetition of what Daniel had said in chapter 7, he said, he had heard the blasphemy. What had been said from the time of Genesis and that Shiloh shall come and the scepter will be in his hand, the man said, you have heard the blasphemy. How ignorant he was that he counted the truth and he counted the prophecy and he counted the proclamation of Jesus Christ as blasphemy. He said, he have heard the blasphemy. What think he? He was asking the crowd, like priest, like people, like preacher, like people, like the pastor, like the pew, like the head, like the rest of them, the followers. And so if the high priest himself, if he didn't know the truth and he counted the truth as blasphemy, what do you expect of the people? What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. They all condemned him to be guilty of death. But hold on. They had decided that before. Before the arrest, before the betrayal, and before this time of kind of kangaroo court that came to say, we're trying him, they had decided, look at John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, reading from verse 56, John chapter 11, reading from verse 56, and then saw day for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye that they will not come to the feast? Verse 57. In verse 57, it says, Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. They had decided that before. The priests' conspiracy against the just. But now the people, you've heard when he said, what think he? And they all said, is guilty of death. And this person they said was guilty of death is the person who is going to be the final judge on the final day. Look at John chapter 5, reading from verse 22. John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son. The judgment of Judas Iscariot is in the hands of Jesus. The judgment of the, uh, for all these high priests and chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the council and the Sanhedrin is in the hands of Jesus. And the judgment of all the persecutors of believers is in the hands of Jesus. And remember, whatsoever you have done to a believer, you have done unto him, whether good or bad. And the Father judges no man. He has committed all judgment unto the Son. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and he has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. In verse 28, it says, uh, that marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, and in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Verse 29 says, And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, Caiaphas, they that have done evil, Pilate, they that have done evil, Herod, they that have done evil, all the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin, rulers of the synagogues, they that have done evil, all those false witnesses, all those that have done evil and are still doing evil today unto the resurrection of damnation. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear 
Not only they must all appear, they will appear and we must appear, but we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone, every false witness, everyone, every repentant sinner, everyone, every condemned betrayer, everyone, Every one of those people that came with their lantern, with their torches and everything, and their clubs in their hands, and they arrested Jesus unjustly, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, when he comes to judge, when he rises to judge, and he judges against all false witnesses, he judges against all evil witnesses, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We're coming back to Mark chapter 14. And we're looking at verse 65, Mark chapter 14, verse 65. See the profanity, and see the insult, and see the abuse, and see the degradation, and see the shame, and see the reproach that came on Jesus Christ. And you're wondering, how could Jesus just stand like that when he said, I could have called 12 legions of angels, I could have prevented this. Why did he allow all this insult, all this assault, all this reproach, all this humiliation? Look at this. And some began to speak on him and to cover his face and to buffet him. And to say unto him, prophesy. And the servants did strike. The servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. The question is, all that profane conduct against him, why did he bear that so that it will become your justifier? So that it will forgive you so that it will cleanse you, so that it will save you. He bore all that on your behalf as your substitute. He bore all that on your behalf as your sin bearer. He bore all that on your behalf as your savior. Look at this in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, looking at verse 23. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All those false witnesses who are sinners and those of us today who have lived our lives before knowing Christ, we have all been sinners. But why did Jesus bore all that shame and reproach and degradation? Look at verse 26. It says in verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time is righteousness that he might be just look at this and the justifier of him that believes in jesus as you read as you think of as a picture all those things were bread that came on him it's not enough to pity him it's not enough to cry for him it's not enough to feel the pain. He did it to justify you. He did it to take your place. He did it so that you will not bear the same guilt and the same, and the same degradation and the same judgment. Now you must believe on him because it's the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. Look at Acts chapter 13. Reading from verse 38, Acts chapter 13, verse 38, it tells us, Be it known unto you, therefore, my brother, be it known unto you, my sister, be it known unto you, everyone hearing, everyone studying together today, be it known unto you, men and brethren, that through this man, through Jesus Christ, who bore our shame, who bore that degradation, who bore all that reproach to this man is preached unto you 
the forgiveness of sins. He took your guilt. He took your punishment. He took the blame. He took the pain so that he will forgive your sin. Look at verse 39. It says in verse 39, and by him all that believe are justified. All that believe are justified is our justifier. That's why he bore all that without bearing those reproaches and without bearing the shame, without bearing all the things they did against him and without bearing the crucifixion. He will not have been able to justify you or justify me. But now all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. If you were to say, I'll try my best, I'll turn over a new leaf, I'll do whatever I can do, I'll make myself righteous, I will keep to the law, you will not be able to perfectly keep to the law that you will not miss in any point. You cannot keep the law like an angel. You cannot keep the law like Adam before he fell. When he was totally innocent, you must have the help and you must have the redemption. You must have the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he must put the power and the release into you, saying, neither do I condemn you. Go and see no more. Because now he is our justifier. You could not be justified by the law of Moses. And look at this now in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, we're looking at verse 5. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it's telling us that Jesus Christ is our justification, is our justifier, is the one that has come to give us forgiveness. It says not by the works of righteousness that we have done. I go to church, that's good. Not by the works of righteousness that ye have done, I give money to the needy, to the poor, to the beggar. Not by the righteousness that ye have done, I go to the river to wash. The river Jordan cannot wash away your sin. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. I fast twice in the week. I fast twice in the week. All the fasting cannot take away your sin. Not by the works of righteousness, what we have done. I do my duty among, you know, the people of God. I do this, I do this, I do that. It is not what you have done. It's what he has done. Not by the works of righteousness, which we have done. But look at this, according to his mercy, he saved us. Everyone needs the mercy of God. From Peter to James to John to Andrew to Matthew to Luke and to Mark and to Paul and to Timothy and to Titus and to you and to me. All of us need the mercy of God so that we can be forgiven and saved and redeemed from our sin. From the prophet to the preacher and the pastor and the evangelist and to the minister in the church and members of any church. We need the mercy of God but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's, that's the only way regeneration can come. That's the only way redemption can come. That's the only way renewal of our spirit can come. That's the only way the strength to be obedient to the Lord. That's the only way it can come, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Which is shed on us abundantly. Which is shed on us abundantly. Abundantly. Illustrated this way, every good work you try to do, every work of righteousness you try to do, will not be wide enough, long enough to cover your shame and to cover your nakedness and to cover your guilt. But it's the blood he shed, it's the redemption that he paid for that is wide enough and long enough and broad enough to cover you abundantly, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says that being justified by his grace, by his grace, by his grace. And the grace of God is so extensive. 
is so deep, is so high, is so broad that it covers everyone. And he can be your justifier today. And he will give you peace in your heart that being justified by his grace, we shall be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Eternal life, eternal life. That eternal life is yours today because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, that's you, that's me, that's every one of us, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish in hell, shall not be lost into the hands of Satan, shall not perish in everlasting damnation, shall not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. He that believeth on him has eternal life. He that believeth not on him has not life, but he remains in damnation. You can come today, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Just call. Just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I know you are my Savior. I receive you as my Savior. I accept you as my Savior. And I give my heart, I give my life, I give my present, I give my past, I give my future now into your hands. And that peace of God will come, that forgiveness will come, that justification will come, and it will give you assurance of heaven. And the Spirit of God will bear witness with your heart. You are now a child of God. No more guilt, no more condemnation, and no more the bearing of your sin, of your punishment. He bore it all for you. Make it a date with the Lord. He justifies those who believe. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. You must, you must, you must talk to the Lord in prayer. He loves you. Even all the people that crucified him, that arrested him, that bore false witness against him, if they had called on the Lord, he would have saved them because he prayed for them. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He's prayed for you and he's praying for you. Let your prayer match the prayer of the Lord for you. Lord, forgive me. Whatever I've done, whether I did it ignorantly or I did it deliberately, Lord, forgive me. And he will. He will justify you. Everything he went through, he did it for you. Lord, save me. And if the Lord has saved you, you tell the Lord, give me the grace, abiding grace. Give me the grace, continuing grace. Give me the grace, sustaining grace. Give me the grace, abundant grace, that I will continue to walk after the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the peace of God reign in your heart, reign in my heart. And now that you are saved, now that you are forgiven, now that you are a child of God, that that same life of Christ he will give unto you. Like he lived confidently and he lived courageously before those unjust judges, before those unjust false witnesses, that whatever is happening, the peace of God will abide in your heart. The calmness, the confidence, and the courage of the Lord will abide in you. And of course, it will never come to your heart, to your life, that you will bear false witness against anyone. Because there's the law of God against false witnesses. And if anyone bore false witness against another, the law is that what he expected to be done to his brother or sister, to his neighbor, to a neighbor, by that false witness will be done unto him. Tell the Lord, if you have been bearing false witness in the past, that that judgment will not come upon you, 
and hide under the blood of Christ, the cleansing blood, the purging blood, the purifying blood, the redeeming blood of the Lamb. And now, after he has forgiven you, that evil witness, that false witness, will not become part of your life, will not be any part of your life anymore. You will not be lawless. You will be law-abiding. That will not bear false witness. Any problem between you and your wife? You will not say so I can exonerate myself. I have to tell lies against her. Do you want? So I can excuse myself. And you'll know I'm not the cause of the problem. I have to. He told lies against me. I have to also be a false witness against him. No, you will not. There's a change. There's a transformation. There is a renewal in the life, in the mind, in the character of the married man, married woman. No more false witness anywhere. You are for the truth. Even when you tell the truth, and the truth is against you. And you say, yes, I'm the one that did it. It was a mistake. It was me. I was careless. It was me. You will not bear false witness and shield the condemnation to another person. You're a new creature now. If any man be in Christ, if any woman be in Christ, it's a new creation. It's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. And then you're not going to continue in false witness because of the faith and because of the Lord and because of the judgment that will come upon false witnesses. Even in this life, what a man sows that he will reap. What a woman sows, that she will reap. What a young person sows, that is what that young person will reap. If you sow false witnesses to get others into trouble, that's what you reap. That's what you need to tell the Lord. Cut down the tree of false witnessing in my life from my tongue. Cut it off entirely. Uproot it from my life. I love my neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to bear false witness against him. And then keep on confirming the coming of Christ. Keep on confirming the doctrines of the word of God. That whatever may be happening, whatever you're going through, there is a confirmation of the faithful witness of his coming. His coming again. Be a faithful witness like Christ is coming again. Be a faithful witness like those apostles of old is coming again. Tell it everywhere. Blow it up everywhere. Speak about it everywhere. Why are you living like this? Because I'm expecting my Lord. Why will you not take part in that? Because I'm expecting my Lord. Why are you walking so carefully and so holily and righteously and justly? Because I'm expecting my Lord. Why are you not complaining? Why are you not grumbling? Because I'm expecting my Lord. And when he comes, I'm going to reign with him. Why is it that all these persecutions and these things, why don't they move you now? And you're just quiet and peaceful and pure and holy. And you're moving on in the way of the Lord. Because I know this is the time of bearing the cross. But I will wear the crown, be a faithful witness, and then join the former witnesses like Daniel, join the former witnesses like the Psalmists, join the former witnesses like Enoch, join the former witnesses that declared that Jesus Christ will reign and his dominion will be forever and ever. And we shall reign with him and then be a fearless witness. You're preaching the word, be a fearless witness. You are testifying to other people. Have the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Have the anointing of the Holy Ghost in your life. Have the authority of the name of Jesus in your mouth. Have the confidence of faith in you. 
because you take the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and have uh, the fearless attitude and fearless confidence that will bear witness to the coming of Christ from glory. He is coming. Is coming for you, is coming for the church, and you'll be part of the church that will go with him on the final day in Jesus' name. And understand all that the priest did, all that those people said, all that betrayal is for your sake. He suffered, so you will not suffer again. He bought the shame, so the shame will not be upon you anymore. He bought the reproach, so the reproach will not be upon your life. He went through all that so that you will not go through that again. Thank the Lord, I'm justified by faith. And because of that, I have peace. I'm justified by faith in Christ. Because of that, I will not come to judgment anymore. I'm justified because of that. I'm an heir of the glory that shall be revealed. I am justified, and everything he suffered, everything he went through, he did that for me. And because of that, I am victorious. I am an overcomer today. Justified. Justified. Justified by Christ the justifier. Thank him. Thank him. And as we go through life, Always have that in your heart, in your mind, and always think about the coming of the Lord is coming again, and you're looking up, and you're looking forward to the time it will come, and you have the assurance in the day or in the night when Christ shall come, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be raised up together with them in the clouds, to be ever with the Lord, to forever be with the Lord, you'll be there, my brother, you'll be there, my sister, we will be there in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for revealing, for refreshing our minds as to what Jesus Christ bore for us. All the false witnesses, all the injustice, all the shame, all the reproach, all the lies, and all the pressure of the punishment, as if he were a sinner, as if he were a criminal. He bore all that for us. Lord, we know that he took our place so that he might bring us to his place, to his side, and his cleansing, and his forgiveness, and his peace, and his justification, so that they might be ours. Lord, we accept. Lord, we receive. Lord, we believe what he has done for each of us. And every one of us, by faith, become a beneficiary of the sacrifice, of the substitution, of the salvation that Jesus Christ has provided. I pray, Lord, that you do a definite redemptive work in the heart of everyone who has heard this word and who will hear this word in Jesus' name. And I pray that you lift up the burden and lift up the guilt and lift up the condemnation on any heart, every heart in Jesus' name. I pray that your spirit will bear witness of the heart of everyone that now their sins are forgiven, that they are free, they are justified, and they will not come to judgment anymore. The grace to now live a victorious life, a righteous life, a peaceful life, a justified life, a glorious life, that grace give to every one of us in Jesus' name, a life without falsehood. A life without hypocrisy. A life without wickedness. A life without evil. A life without sin. A life without causing trouble for anybody. Lord, let it be reproduced in every one of our lives. 
in Jesus' name. And I help us, Lord, to take this same message of justification, this same gospel of redemption, and this same gospel of the grace of God to all our neighbors, to all our friends, to all the people that do not know that they too will come to the same experience of salvation, of redemption that you have brought us into. Help us, Lord, to continue enduring, continue living victoriously, even to the very end. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.